Welcome. <laughs> Welcome all the Facebook viewers and, and uh, all the uh, uh, viewers that uh, are watching us from the big city of Rochelle, Missouri. And uh, we just thank you for being here with us. Today we are continuing our study of why are we here. And uh, we're going to be reading from Matthew 25, 14 through 21. Uh, and I, we use the NIV version. Matthew 25, 14 through 21. It is not my house is the name of it. And we're going to be reading again from 25, 14 through 21. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money. To another, two talents. And to another, one talent. Each according to their ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work, and he gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted. Master, you had entrusted. We feed five talents uh, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word. The year was 1997. Bob and Ruth Stanford had seen earlier that year their son, their first son, graduate high school. We were now in the parking lot of Kirksville College, waving goodbye at him. His mother was crying. I probably was too. She says, is he going to be OK? Oh, yeah, he'll be all right. We got about five miles down the road, and I said, Ruth, I think we need to buy a new van. <laughs> well, she said, we probably can afford it now. So we went home and we very shortly bought a brand new van. Now, Wayne came home a couple of weeks later, and we found out that he had joined a Christian group, a CCF or, or whatever the initial was, Christian Campus Fellowship, something like that. We were so proud of him. Well... A couple of weeks, he went back to school. A couple of weeks after that, he gives, I, hear, I get a call from Wayne. He says, Dad, our group is going on a mission trip. And we can't afford a bus. We're going, I think it was Alabama, somewhere quite a ways away. He's not here, I don't think. He can't argue with you. It was quite a ways away. And he says, we don't, we don't have the money for a bus, so we're borrowing vans. Can we borrow your van? Now, I've talked to you about how I can have things pass through my mind in a second's time. All kinds of shh. And let me tell you the first thing that passed through my mind. My new van? <laughs> you want to borrow my new van? It's got 300 miles on it. It's still got the plastic in the seat. It still smells like a new car without the spray. You want to buy and drive it the farthest he'd ever driven was Kirksville, and that was one time, two times. And with five or six kids in the car with you? Well, that was the first thing I thought. And then the Holy Spirit test, uh, tapped me on the shoulders. And he said, Bobby, that's not your car. That's God's car. He's wanting to go on a mission trip, not to Florida to go look at all the pretty girls or anything like that. He's going on a mission trip. 
and it's not your car. So I said, sure, Wayne, no problem. I, I said, I'll ask Mom. I'm sure it's okay with her. So they went on that mission trip, borrowed our new car. Good thing because they're on that mission trip is where he met Kelly. <laughs> and uh, all good things from there. Little did I know that when I thought it's time to buy a new van, it was going to be used for a mission trip. I didn't know that. But an amazing lesson was shown to me. A big lesson for Ruth and I both. Simply seeing life from God's view. God's view was that was his van and it should be used for something good like that. The way you and I see life shapes our life. We can ask people about their lives and say, what is your life like? And boy, you get all kinds of answers. Answers like, oh, my life is a circus. It's, it's a minefield. It's a roller coaster. It's a puzzle with a piece missing. <laughs> it's a carousel, ups and downs. How we look or see our lives will be how we express our lives. How we express our lives. It'll cause us the way we wear our clothes, our jewelry, our hair, how we spend our time, our priorities in our lives. As Christians, we are to live the life God wants us to live. That's what we're supposed to be doing. His purpose. Fulfilling God's purpose. That's the first thing. Fulfilling God's purpose for my life. How do I do that? Here's the next one. To fulfill the purpose God has for you, or has made for you, the beginning of the time, the scripture says, we need to challenge conventional wisdom and replace it with biblical wisdom. You see, the world's view of, of wisdom and the Bible's view of wisdom are completely opposite. The priorities of the world are completely different than the priorities, and we've talked about that many times. But let me look at, let you look at this scripture Romans 12, 2 says it's so much better than I can. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Boy, there's some important words there. Do not be conformed to the pattern, but be what? transformed. That means we're going to have to be changed. We all have this humanistic value system that's got to be transformed like a transformer changes from the kids from one thing to another. The renewing of our mind is going to be different. Then you will be able to approve and know what God's will is what God's will is, pleasing, his pleasing and perfect will. Transform. The Bible offers us three images that will teach us God's view of life. If we apply these, it will change our life on how we handle things and how we do things and what's important to us. It will also change our eternity. So let's look at them. Number one, we studied this last week. If you missed it last week, you can go back and see it. But it's life is a temporary assignment. Life is a temporary assignment. It's a staging area. It's a warm-up for the real thing. It's the preschool, if you will. And when we realize how short 
our lives are just a blink compared to eternity, which is forever and ever and ever and ever. And eternity only offers two things or two places, and that's heaven or hell. That's what it offers. If we accept Jesus Christ and, and ask him into our hearts and love him and, and uh, make him the Lord of our, our lives, we will live with him forever. If we don't, we'll be without God for eternity. More if you want to go back and see more of, the, of that number one. But number two, the first one is a temporary assignment. Number two is life on earth is a test. It is a test. A, God continually tests our character. God continuously tests our character. Now, what is our character? What is our character? Well, it's our faith. It's our obedience. It's our love. Integrity. Our loyalty. I'll go over those again. Faith. Obedience, love, integrity, and loyalty. God tested me, didn't he? He tests me all the time. Some I fail, some I don't. All through the Bible we see tests. Abraham was tested his faith by t telling him to uh, sacrifice an offer of his son, Isaac. Well, we know that was just a test. Jacob had to work extra years of labor to, to be able to earn Rachel. Adam and Eve were tested. They failed. David had many tests. King David, a wonderful, godly man, but he, he failed many tests. But he passed many tests, and God continued to use him. Joseph, oh, one of my favorite people, he not only had a, a, a color of many colors, but he passed the tests with many colors. Flying colors, as we say B, character is both developed and revealed by tests. By tests. We, as God's children, are tested every single day. He watches our response to things. He watches our response to people. Our response to success. Conflicts. Illnesses, disappointments. He tests us every day and he watches them with little things. Opening the door for someone. Giving a kind word to a person that's checking you out or, or a waitress. Little things. He also watches the way we handle the big things like unanswered prayers. Lord, when are you ever going to answer my prayer? You know, he watches that. There's nothing wrong with asking. But he watches us. Unanswered prayers. Undeserved criticism. How do you handle that? I've often said you can't control the things people say, but you can control the way you react to it. He watches those things. How we handle our possessions. When you understand that life is a test, you realize that nothing is insignificant in your life and there's no accidents. Every single day is an important day. Every, imp every minute is an important minute for growing and growth opportunities to deepen our character or to depend on God. C. God wants us to pass the test. That's the good news, is he wants us to pass the test. He's not doing a trick qu quiz or anything. He wants us to pass them. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted... He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So you can endure it. He wants us to pass the test. Every time you pass a test, God notices it. I believe there's a celebration in heaven. A 
and he makes plans to reward you in eternity. Blessed are those, the Bible says, who endure when they are tested. Blessed are they. So, the first one is, of course, eternity is a short one. I mean, eternity is a long, long time. Our life here, number one, is a temporary life. Number two, life is a test. Thirdly, and this is a big one, life on earth is a trust. It's not trust, it is a trust. You know what a trust is. Here's the definition by the dictionary. A trust is a legal relationship in which the holder of such trust gives it to another who must keep it and use it solely for another benefit. What's that mean to us? A big one. A, we are stewards of whatever God has given us. We are stewards of whatever God has given us. This concept must start with this, that God owns everything and everyone on earth. It's got to start there. Look at Psalms 24.1. 24.1. Oh, David, a psalm, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. God owns everything. We really don't own anything in this life. Here on this brief stay on this earth, it was God's property before you got here, and it's going to be somebody else's property when you die. But we enjoy it while we have it. But it belongs to God. <clears throat> B, the first job God gave mankind, or humans, was to manage and take care of God's stuff on earth. Adam and Eve. Let's look at that. Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. They were told to take care of it. But God gave them some rules and regulations and stuff, and they failed that. But you and I still today are entrusted with what God has given us, and he wants us to use it the way he wants us to use it. How, will, how am I handling the thing that's God given to us or to me? Because, this is one of our questions, because God owns it, I must take care of it. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Now, I love the parable that we read today. The parable of the talents, if you will. A master, an owner, had talents. He must have had what? Five, six, seven, eight of them. He gave five to one, two to another, one to the other. And the Bible says he gave to them that they were able to manage it. He didn't give the person with one five because he wasn't able to handle that. But he knew the people he gave it to could handle it. You and I are given what we can handle. I am not a multimillionaire because I couldn't handle it. <laughs> but I have what God has given to me and I'm able to manage that. We are given what we can use, we can uh, to manage. Now, the Bible says that the, the owner went away for a long, long time. That's Jesus Christ. That's the symbol of Jesus He's not here with us right now, but he's given us the things that we can use here on this earth. And someday he's coming back. But this master came back, it says. The owner returned, and he evaluated each servant's responsibility and rewarded them accordingly. Let's look again at First Matthew, or Matthew uh, 25, 2. 
And the master replied to them, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I have put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's joy. He entrusted it to him. He entrusts everything to us. At the end of our life here on this earth, you will be evaluated and rewarded accordingly to how well you handled God's stuff, all the stuff that he entrusted into your care, your time. That's a gift from God. Your children, your friends, your relationships, all the things that, that you purchased, all of those things. He will check and see how well you use those to glorify him. See, money is both a test and a trust. Not only all those things I just mentioned, but also the money. We talk about that almost every Sunday, how God has given us the ability to make money and to have it. But God uses, this is important, God uses finances to teach us to trust him. For many of us, money is a the greatest test. For many of us, money is the greatest test. Why? Because it's mine. I worked hard for it. I made it. It's mine. I can do whatever I want to with it because it's mine. That's the worldly view of it. The Christian view is it, of it is it's all gone. Yes, you worked hard for it. Yes, you spent overtime for it. Yes, you, you did all of these for it. But God's given you the ability to, to, to earn it. He's given you the brains to be able to do a job, the health to be able to do it. It's God's money. It's all God's. And he watches how we use it to see how trustworthy we are with it. Now, here's another scripture that we don't understand very often. Luke 16, 11. This is very important. 16, 11. I have six. Luke 16, 11. Okay. I think that's 6, 11. We need to read 16, 11. You can't find that real quick, can you? Matthew 16, 11, NIV. No, that's not it. Either. Huh? Oh, what did I say? Oh. Luke 16, 11. All right, well, let's try Luke 16, 11. Luke 16:11 NIV So, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Write that down in your sticky part of your brain. So, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you in true riches? There is a direct relationship between how I use my money and the quality of my spiritual life. How I manage God's money, worldly wealth, determines how much God can trust us with our spiritual blessings, our true riches. How much we'll be able to understand. How much spiritual uh, Truth will be able to comprehend. And not only that, not just on this earth, but in eternity. The things that I'm going to be doing in eternity is going to be determined by, be determined by what I do here on this earth. What jobs I'll have. What I'll be involved in. Luke 12, 48. For everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. 
And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. The more we're given, the more is expected out of us. Life is a test and a trust. And the more God gives you, the more responsibility respects out of us. D, our last one. If you trust everything God gives you as a trust, or if you treat everything God gives you as a trust, he's going to give you three rewards. Let's put that back up. Romans, uh, Matthew 25, 21. Look at that. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's joy. What's he going to give us? Number one, affirmation. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. He's then going to do what? He's going to give you promotion. You did well with a few things. That's what he's going to do here on this earth. It's going to do it in heaven. The more we are able to do the right things here on this earth, the more we'll be in charge of in heaven. And we'll have a promotion. And what's the last one? We're going to celebrate with God. Come and join your, your father's joy. Don't we look forward to that? Come and enjoy your master's joy. What a blessing. Come, good and faithful servant. I'd like to share with you a story about a man by the name of John Wesley. He was a wonderful, wonderful preacher back in the day. Evangelist, theologian. Many books probably in our library today by John Wesley. But this is a true story. He was off somewhere probably in the church and some of his friends came to him and said, John, we have terrible news. They said, your house just burned down. He says, no, that, that's impossible. They said, no, we, we're telling you it burned down. We were, just came from there. He says, no, that, that's impossible. They said, no, we stood in the ashes, John. Your house has burned down. He says, you see, I, I don't own a house. He says, God's given me a house to take care of and to live in. But if he lets it burn down and he doesn't put it out, that's his problem. <laughs> He's going to have to find me another house. Now that man understood that you could have something without possessing it. He didn't hold on to it so tightly that when something went down or when it went down, he didn't go down with it. That would be hard, wouldn't it? We possess nothing. All belongs to God. This is a lesson all of us need to learn. First off, life is temporary. There's tests on this earth. And life is a trust as we take care of God's things. When we understand this, it can change our lives. It can change our priorities. It can change what's really important in our lives. And the fact that we can understand that life is temporary on earth and, and that it's a trust and all of these things is a blessing from God. Most people can't understand that. And they miss so many important things in their lives. Because the temporary things is what's taking care over in their mind. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given to us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for helping us to understand that it all belongs to you. It's a blessing that we're able to live here on this earth. Help us to live the things and do the things that we should do, Lord. Because when Jesus comes back, we want to be able to give back many things that he has given to us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.